evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, sir. This is Amnan. Sir, how are you doing? Okay, we are fine. Thank you. Yeah. So my first doubt is, sir, at where to wavelength does the electromagnetic uh, spectrum end and uh, where does the uh, wave production occur? No, just one. I was not able to hear your question. Say it again. What's the question? Sir, at what uh, wavelength does the electromagnetic spectrum end uh, and where does the uh, wave production occur? Where does, what happened? So that I, he said, where does the spectrum end at what wavelength? But what is the other part? Second part? Uh, sir, pair production. Pair production. Okay. Uh, electromagnetic radiation does not end anywhere. Its wavelength, uh -huh. uh, its wavelength can come from zero to infinity, literally infinity. There is no limit. What happens is when <clears throat> wavelength approaches infinity is not a problem. It's a constant electric field. <clears throat> but zero wavelength is very high frequency, means very high energy photon, and uh, beyond certain energy. Uh, electromagnetism, as we know, probably would not work. <clears throat> so the reasonable uh, one limit we people put on the wavelength is what is called the Planck length, uh, which is the 10 power minus 33 centimeters. Uh, certainly uh, at that point, but much before that, there is something when electromagnetism and weak interaction unify. Their photon, as we understand, changes into something else. So that is the another uh, limit you will take when photon character changes. Pair production starts when the energy of uh, a photon uh, becomes uh, larger than the energy of the electron positron pair. That is about 1.1 MeV. Electron, as you know, has a mass of 0.5 MeV in electron volt. So electron positron pair is about one about one electron one MeV. So when the photon energy becomes larger than that, then in principle, in presence of matter, it can create electron positron pair. You understand? Um, uh, yes, sir. So my second doubt is, so why does the uh, electron positron annihilation uh, always yields energy in the gamma ray uh, band? It's precisely because what I said. <laughs> electron positron pair, when it annihilates into photon, it will create a photon of energy, MeV. In fact, two photons of, if electron positron pair annihilates into two photons, each photon will have energy of half MeV. MeV photons are gamma ray. Kilo electron volt, the energy of the photon ka, that is x rays and when you go to MeV energy of order, it's gamma rays. Anything above the MeV or something is gamma rays. So my third doubt is, so when a star of adequate mass collapses and... Uh, okay. yeah. After the third question, we'll take somebody else's question. But what is your question? Third question? Uh, yes, sir. Hmm. So when a star of adequate mass collapses and goes supernova, Mm -hmm. uh, so, where does the energy come from that causes the explosion? So, to be honest, I know that uh, when a star collapses, uh, energy is produced. But precisely, where does it come from? It's a, gravita it's a gravitational binding energy. So when, it, when the star collapses, it becomes more bound because it becomes compressed. No? When something is more compressed, it is more tightly bound. Gravitational binding energy is negative. So, suppose energy was say, minus 5 earlier, now it became minus 10. Minus 10 is less than minus 5. So, the remaining energy is the thing which you will take the explosion. Okay? That's the energy which goes into the explosion. Okay? You understand, right? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now some other question. Some, some, somebody else. Oh, well, may I ask? Sir, how is the light, uh, the speed of light uh, measured or calculated? Is there any experiment then or something? Uh, okay. See, I mean, I do not know what are the latest measurements of photon, of, of the light, uh, because the people have uh, devised very sophisticated techniques for measuring the speed of light. <clears throat> but uh, calculation comes from Maxwell equation. Uh, light is an electromagnetic wave. Okay. And this electromagnetic, uh, by the way, Bhavna, you are in which class? Sir, ninth. Ninth. You will be reading, uh, I think in 10th and onwards, you will be reading various equations of electricity and magnetism, like Faraday's law, Ampere's law, right? Some of these things you will be reading. And they are part of collection of equations, which are called Maxwell equations. These equations govern the uh, nature of electric field and magnetic, magnetic field. And they actually produce these equations, give a solution which are electromagnetic waves. 
these electromagnetic waves are the light. Light is an electromagnetic wave. You know that, right, Bhagna? Yes, sir. Okay. Electromagnetic. So when you yeah, so when you calculate these equations, when you calculate this uh, 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 from Maxwell equation, this uh, equation for the wave, it also tells you what the velocity of the wave in terms of co constant which appears in the equation. For example, uh, you know Coulomb's law, right? One by four pi epsilon zero, right? Q one Q two by R square. That you know, right? Coulomb 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 force between two charges is Q one Q two divided by four pi epsilon naught R square. You have seen that formula? No, sir. Okay, you will be studying. So various force laws and various current laws they have some constant inside them. Dielectric constant and uh, permittivity. These are these are various constant. They are measured in experiment. And uh, their values are known. So when you put these values, you get Maxwell equation with the correct constants. And when you calculate wave equation, it's a combination of these constants which gives you velocity of the wave. That's how you calculate. Now measurement is uh, I do, actually do not know what is the latest way of it. Originally people measured the wave which was it was it's an incredibly fast moving wave. So I think they used some kind of shutters which were um, very fast shutters and uh, how. Uh, one pulse goes and goes to some other place. I think that's how it was done. Um, I don't know how they measure it right now. Well, I mean, not right now you could do. I mean, you know the velocity of, you know, distance of distance. Oh, right now it will be very simple. You know, you know the distance of certain objects precisely. Now, these days they have clocks. They have clocks which can measure time of nanosecond. You know, literally nanosecond. You simply keep a meter, I think, hundred meter away, and Throw a laser beam and see it bounce back, and see the you know, when it light comes back. Hundred meter light will come back in about ten power minus six seconds. Okay, even ten power eight meters per second is the speed light. Three times ten power eight, so it will come back in microsecond. It, you can make fantastic measurement how much time light has taken and come back from mirror. And you can just measure time and get the speed of light. But I'm sure they have better ways of doing it. But it's a very simple measurement one can do in laboratory. MSc lab, I think, can do it in experiment. You understand, Babna? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, my question is that how uh, time and gravity is related? Time and gravity. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you are in which class, Abhishek? Twelve. Twelve. Okay. Um, you you know about time dilation? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, special yes. relativity. Have you heard about this name? You have not studied yes, it, but you have not. So, uh, you, uh, you probably know that when things are moving with fast velocity, the clock slows down. You know that? Yes, sir. Uh, I want to know that. Right. How right. it happens? Right. So we, this is comes from Lorentz transformation. This is Called special theory of relativity of Albert Einstein, that then your clock slows down. So when you come back after some time, uh, uh, you will be a little younger than somebody who's staying at on Earth. This is measured. This is when they when people go in satellite when a uh, space shuttle and all that, their clock and they keep, they stay there for months together. Their clock actually, if they don't synchronize, their clock actually would slow down compared to that. If they come back, they're a little bit younger. Okay. Because this is, but this is special theory of relativity. Now, what happens is gravitation actually is related to motion in some sense. If the, this is called equivalence principle, that uh, gravitational force is almost like acceleration. Um, this, was the, this, is, this was the basis of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, to understand that, you should uh, remember the following. Have you ever sat in a uh, that ride, which is a giant wheel? In exhibition, they have uh, it goes up and comes down. Have you ever sat in that? Yes, sir. When it comes down, it's a very strange feeling, right? It comes down. You you feel you are a little bit you have little less weight. Yes, sir. Have you, have you sat in the roller coaster? Roller coaster. It happens also in the lift. Lift, yeah, lift, made, uh, lift, made, lift made very difficult to notice. If you have noticed, that's great. But I have I find it difficult to notice in lift. But yes, lift made happens. When lift actually goes up, you feel a little heavier. When suddenly lift starts, at the initial point, you feel. 
um, so this acceleration so what happens is when you are accelerating uh, up you feel more force more gravity when you coming down you feel less gravity idea is suppose lift falls down freely suppose uh, hopefully it doesn't happen with any of us but suppose lift you are in the lift and rope is cut down the steel rope and lift is freely uh, freely falling then you will be weightless gravity will disappear for you so gravity in some sense uniform gravity is equivalent to acceleration okay so this way you can sort of see and i told you acceleration means change of velocity okay and velocity related to time dilation acceleration is change of velocity and velocity and and uh, velocity is related to time dilation so it is not surprising to note that gravity actually is also lead to leads to time dilation so when there is a very strong gravity it's as if there is a very strong acceleration and that means there is strong change in velocity so there is some effect on time and it does happen when you are in a gravity uh, in a uh, region which has a strong gravity the clock slow down that is why if you are on earth and if you are on a satellite satellite has less gravity than on earth because satellite is little away from earth so the clocks on earth are slower than clocks on the satellite you understand abhishek yes okay and by the way this these are this is very important to note all these time dilation because of motion of satellite and also because of gravity field difference these are incorporated in your gps device in your mobile phone mobile phone you know how gps when you when you do your uh, google uh, map google map how it works it tells you exactly your position you know if you are moving or walking it tells you how it does it uh, there are satellites moving around earth and they send signal and your the mobile phone detects those signals and from different satellites it gets signals at different times from that it knows exactly where you are for that your clock clock must be fantastically synchronized to clock on satellite but satellite clock is moves at different rate because of on, that on your for two reasons because of motion it slows down but because of less gravity it becomes faster combined the combination of the, both these effect must be calculated and they are compensated in the electronic circuit otherwise you will get a wrong answer and gravitational effects are actually much bigger than the effects of a special relativity yes, sir but so then the most fundamental entity Uh, which one sir? Gravity or time? Well, it is. It's not a point of what is the more fundamental entity. Time is a time is like space. You know, x, y, z. You need to denote things happening. So some object is moving or or happening at some place. Something happening. You need to tell its coordinate x, y, z, and t. Okay. So you need time just like you need space coordinate. You need for that. then you also need to know whether there is a gravity around or not so both things have their own importance i don't see much uh, point in this key what is more fundamental so you need x y z and t all these four uh, numbers you need and you need to know also know whether you are you need x y z and t where so actually i suppose you may have heard that gravity is equivalent to curvature of a space no space time yeah so in that sense you need x y z and t coordinates but these coordinates are in which kind of surface which kind of manifold that decide the five whole thing the whole thing is together whole thing is strongly coupled whole thing is coupled to each other gravity is what kind of surface you have and then you write down coordinate x y z t whole thing is together in some sense okay yes sir <laughs> फरहाना तबस्सुम जी हेलो सर हीट रेडिएशन गुड़ा इलेक्ट्रो इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक रेडिएशन दे दिए नो हीट वेल देयर टू थिंग्स हीट इज हीट एंड थर्मल रेडिएशन इज इट्स नॉट कॉल हीट रेडिएशन बट यू मे देयर इज अ टर्म व्हिच इज यूज्ड कॉल्ड थर्मल रेडिएशन हीट इज नॉट रेडिएशन हीट इज एनर्जी 
which is uh, so i i uh, uh, you you want uh, so let me display explain both terms you no know? when a hot body comes in contact with a cold body the hot body has molecules atoms which are moving fast 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 lot of kinetic energy and cold body has atoms moving with less energy so the hot body transfers some of that energy to cold body that is called heat so lot of the random kinetic energy of hot body goes to the slowly moving atoms in the cold body and that energy transfer is called heat transfer now thermal radiation is an electromagnetic radiation by every body which has a temperature it doesn't happen at zero temperature every body which has some temperature t temperature it emits some radiation um that radiation is typically goes at 3 to the power 4 temperature to the power 4 but it has a coefficient which depends on what kind of body it is and if it is a black body then it has a specific coefficient it's called stephen boltzmann law but it is not a black body then it is it has some different kind of coefficient so that is called thermal radiation the thermal radiation is an electromagnetic radiation which has a very precise spectrum so it has a certain frequency certain intensity at certain wavelength different frequency at different wavelength you just check on internet it's called black body radiation it has a very beautiful curve so it will tell you what is the intensity of radiation at what wavelength that is called black body radiation that is the thermal radiation and that thermal radiation depends at different temperatures that is our thermal radiation i don't know whether this now in electromagnetic wave what happens is if you see the light coming from sun um, it has a light but also seems warm so light has lot of wavelength the sunlight the wavelength which is infrared it has a wavelength larger than the red that when it falls on your body it heats up your body but visible light even falls on your body you don't feel it at all so that also sometimes you may call thermal radiation it's infrared radiation wave radiation wave with wavelength bigger than the red radiation that light okay sir mo गोटे बही थर्माल रेडिएशन रो वेलोसिटी लाइक सी तो इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक Uh, electromagnetic radiation the speed will be c right okay sir uh, and if sir, you take thermal radiation black body radiation it also when i was saying black body radiation every hot body emits radiation i meant electromagnetic radiation i didn't say that i meant electromagnetic radiation every hot body emits an electromagnetic radiation spectrum called black body in which intensity of different wavelength of electromagnetic radiation is given as a it's called black body radiation spectrum that also it will so everything is speed of light light uh, speed is speed of light sir uh, uh, we generally uh, uh, see the object which emits visible radiation then how right. night vision camera uh, captures the infrared radiation that's correct how does it capture uh, yes sir oh it it doesn't capture directly what it does is that it has sensors ctd center sensors your eye our eye has receptors which are only sensitive to visible radiation but you can make detectors which can detect any if you have a you have mobile phone right mobile phone captures electromagnetic signal you know in which wavelength microwave microwave you see the very long wavelength your radio uh, general older form of radio they detect signals on uh, in meter wavelength okay so this is uh, you can put a, make a detector which can detect electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength so what happens is they make detectors which are like as if as, as your mobile camera has but those detector has tiny pixels they are sensitive to infrared radiation so it detects and forms a picture so what you see in your infrared camera is a is like a tv little tv the detector detects those infrared signals and projects it on form of a screen and convert it to visible light so you can see it projects it on a visible screen so you see uh, that is uh, uh, i mean uh, that is uh, like uh, uh, red color and no it's uh, a grayish 
you have seen, I mean, they can make colors, but it's normally typically blue, grayish, greenish picture you have, you have seen. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's, that's because it's an infrared light. They're converting it to a, a visible signal. signal. Uh, so, the, are they interpreting those uh, wavelengths or uh, why they are? Yeah, they convert, they're interpreting. You're right. So, they are interpreting those uh, because it's not in uh, green light. Inside is not a green light. <laughs> Right, okay. infrared is a wavelength bigger than red light. So they take that signal, they convert it to a, some screen in which it appears as a. In principle, with more expensive thing, they can make a colored image also. But normally, if it's cheaper one, it just appears as a green light. But very good, very expensive camera, they can convert to whatever light screen you want. It's a matter of interpretation. Uh, sir, another question is that. Uh, uh, in the radiation law of that body, there is a term that uh, at uh, uh, thermal equilibrium. What do you mean by that? By thermal okay. equilibrium. At the meaning, thermal, thermal, okay. meaning, meaning of thermal equilibrium for any body is he, no more changes on large scale happen in that. So, for example, I'll give you an example. You take a, you take a uh, hot water in one bucket and cold water in one bucket okay and you mix them you take hot water in one bucket and mix in this initially what you will find is that somewhere there is hot water somewhere cold water and they are all kind of mixing are happening you wait for a while what you will achieve is in the in after some time whole water will have a uniform temperature in between somewhere huh? so initially things are out of equilibrium because some portion was hot some got cold hot portion gave heat to cold and cold to heat from hot, but eventually it's settled into some uniform temperature. After the temperature doesn't change, no changes in temperature. So when things like temperature and pressure and some of these things which you measure, they stop changing. That's called equilibrium. Uh, it doesn't mean nothing is happening in this because ultimately there are molecules inside the system. There are molecules are randomly moving. So it's not that motion has stopped, no. But when you calculate things which are called thermodynamic variables like pressure, temperature, and some of these things, they don't change anymore. So thermal, when you say radiation is in equilibrium with the body, what means is when radiation is falling on a body, the body is will absorb radiation, emit some radiation. If the body emits more radiation or less radiation than the radiation falling on that, it's clearly not in equilibrium. If the body gets heat, heated up, then radiation as much emitted by the body and absorbed by the body is the same. So after that, body temperature will not change. Body will achieve some temperature. It will say it is in equilibrium with the radiation. Typically, so, for the black body, it happens when its temperature is when it starts emitting a black body spectrum. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Some other question by somebody. So can I ask? Amlan, yeah. Uh, maybe Amlan, just wait a minute. Let's see if there is somebody else asking. Then I will come back. Hello, myself Shashwati. I have it. Shashwati, tell me. Shashwati. Yes, sir. So just uh, previously you were uh, like uh, mentioning various colors of light, green light and red light. I had a doubt that does the color of light affect the speed of the light and if yes, then why? Okay. Color of the light does not affect the speed of light in vacuum. In vacuum, everything travels with same speed. So if you have a red light, blue light, green light, at, at empty space, everything at the same speed. T times uh, 300,000 kilometers per second, roughly that much. But these things travel with this different speed in medium. So, for example, when you take a water or a glass, then red light, blue light, and green light have different refractive index. Refractive index, that is why you see the spectrum in the prism, because they have different refractive indices. Red light, blue light, green light, they bend at different angles uh, because of law of refraction. So, the speed of light in medium is given by speed of light in vacuum divided by refractive index. So, okay. for example, red light, you understand. So, if refractive index is different, the speed of light would be different or different color in a medium. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. I mean, I don't think that question is still settled, but. Uh, it typically happens because uh, believe is believed to happen because Earth has a molten core in the center. Of course, in the complete center, it's a solid thing, but there is a molten core around it. 
iron. It is molten iron core and a lot of other material also, but a lot of material metal molten core. And the motion is happening, it's very turbulent motion. And these people know that if there is any residual magnetic field, even tiny magnetic field somewhere, and this kind of magnetic field can come from original somewhere when the planet forms, then this turbulent motion of molten core amplifies the magnetic field. It, it increases the magnetic field. It's called, it works like a dynamo almost. Dynamo, you know, in, in dynamo, what happens? The motion of magnets in coil produces magnetic field. If what happens when there's a turbulent motion in a plasma or a conducting medium, it's a turbulent motion in that, rotation turbulent motion, then any tiny magnetic field starts amplifying and it starts generating um, current. It becomes, sorry, it starts generating a strong magnetic field. That is the reason actually that you know that the Earth's magnetic pole is not fixed always, it keeps changing. Sometimes it flips. What is North Pole and South Pole, magnetic North Pole was long time ago was South Pole and North Pole actually. In that and the reason is that this turbulent motion is random. So it's not a very regular motion. The turbulent motion can create magnetic field which can change direction. You understand? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, may I ask? Huh. Yes, yes. Sir, is matter exists in the form of waves and can you explain the branch of quantum mechanics, the field of Bab it? Babna, you are in which class? Sir, ninth. Ninth, okay. You will be studying this. You will be studying what is called Bohr's model. Bohr's model of atom. Yes, so, sir. Uh, right? So what they say there is that uh, matter in general behaves like a wave. That's correct. At very small scales. Uh, they will, in board model, what they use it, they use this model for electron. Electron moving around the proton or the nucleus. So, what it means when they say wave is, uh, uh, as wave, you know, uh, what surface wave, water it moves like up and down like that. Um, uh, the idea is this, that the, uh, the motion of electron around the atom is not um, like a planet move around the sun. Because planets, they move around sun, they move in regular orbit, complete regular orbit. You know exactly where Earth is right now, exactly where it will be later, exactly where it will be later. So, you know, uh, if you go there, you'll find the Earth. Now, what it turns out that for very tiny particles, this kind of motion, which is obtained from Newton's laws, is not valid anymore. Newton's laws, what happens that if you know a body at certain point of time and certain position, and you know what are the forces acting, you precisely know where it will be at some later time. When you will read quantum mechanics, what will happen is, it turns out that if you know the body at certain time, at some place, say electron, tiny particle, later time if you want to calculate, it may be there, it may not be there. What you do but is... But why is it... Like why classical is, mechanics says something else and... Quantum mechanics something else, precisely. So what you know is, what we know is one classical mechanics is not valid for very tiny particles. It's not valid. Classical mechanics, as we know, Newton's laws and all these things, they get violated at very tiny scales. And the correct mechanics is quantum mechanics, not classical mechanics. Quantum mechanics, when you apply to big objects, it reduces to classical mechanics. Because what happens is, so, so what happens in class quantum mechanics? You try to calculate motion of electron. You know the force is acting on electron at certain time. You think electron would go there by Newton's laws, but it may go somewhere else. You may find it somewhere else. So how do you know? So what people do is they calculate probability. They say, okay, so if electron is here, what is the probability it will go there? What will probability go somewhere else? Now how do you need calculate probability? So it can go anywhere. So what you do is you calculate a probability. The probability starting from some point the probability is given a function of x. So it is at probability as function x is some function f of x. And uh, it, this function actually becomes complex number. It's a complex quantity. So it is a, um, uh, uh, it is, uh, the probability is given by uh, psi star psi, basically some mod x, mod psi scale. Um, so this, this function obeys an equation which is like a wave equation. Wave equation, you know, that which, like cos, cos kx minus omega t, that's a wave, right? Cos, cox, I mean, cos x minus bt, right, is a wave. You know wave equation? Have you seen wave equation? 
have you seen wave equation cos x minus vt is a wave equation is oscillating wave like that but what happens is that the probability of electron motion is given by an equation which is the equation obeyed by a wave electron doesn't move like a wave its probability behaves like a wave in some sense that's why it's called particle behaves like a wave okay sir thank you sir Sir, I also wanted to know the existence of dark matter, and why can't we uh, detect that? No, we do detect dark matter. It's not that we don't detect. Uh, how if we didn't detect, how would we know there is dark matter? But we don't have a direct detection. So what? How we detect dark matter is that we we see the um, uh, we see the motion of uh, we we know how different we can observe different galaxies which are very far away from us. these galaxies you know you know about galaxies yes sir okay so galaxies are objects of lots of stars hundreds of billions of stars yes like sir. our galaxy the milky way right and they are rotating so it's a milky way and they are rotating spiral galaxies andromeda galaxies they are rotating so if they are rotating then they are stars in the periphery of the galaxy they are going around in orbit so uh, you have not studied kepler's laws as yet right have you studied kepler's laws so in book it is like uh, given in a very little portion so. right so kepler's law like kepler's law you can tell you know the earth goes around sun um jupiter goes around sun if you know yeah. the distance of jupiter from sun and you know velocity of jupiter you can calculate mass of sun that from that knowing the distance of jupiter from sun and the velocity of jupiter from sun you can calculate mass how much force is acting so force is by by uh, by sun you can calculate so what they do is they calculate the motion they know the velocity of the star they know distance of the star from center they can calculate how much mass is contained in the galaxy what they find is total mass from this calculation is much more than the mass they see in star so that means there is lot of mass which we don't see and that's what called dark matter so but so what is this dark matter people don't know it may be just tiny planets because you don't see tiny planets or it may be some kind of particle which don't emit light so people are trying to search for those dark matter and they have not detected as yet okay. okay now somebody else before we okay so can else. i ask ha uh, amla you can ask now ha uh, please sir i do now recently talked uh, about gravity theory abhishek so my doubt is uh, so what evidence is there that supports the theory of curved space what is the evidence that so, so say it again what So what is the uh, so what evidence is there that supports the theory of curved space? What is the evidence that theory of curved space is correct? Yes, sir. Well, I mean theory of curved space. You see, um, most uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity says theory of curved space because it replaces force of gravity by um, uh, space curvature, space-time curvature. But for weak gravitational field, when the gravity is not very strong, Einstein's equation reduces to Newton's equation. So whatever we have done, whatever measurements we do on Earth, etc., they are what you would get from Newton's equations anyway. So Einstein, so that really is not a test of curvature that much. But people are now able to measure the um, uh, gravitational force for very strong bodies. Uh, you have heard about gravitation detection of gravitational waves. Yes, sir. Now gravitational waves have been detected by collision of black holes. So those waves which have been detected. the calculation of those have been done using curved space if you use newton's equation calculation you will get wrong answer you will never be able to get those uh, gravitational wave you first of all you don't get gravitational wave gravitational wave itself arises because of curvature of space time newton's equation don't give gravitational wave only other theory of gravity is gravity that of einstein with curved space time which gives you gravitational wave so first statement would be that the existence of gravitational wave is a direct signal of curvature of space time much more than that even the nature of the detailed calculations of curvature space time are verified by these gravitational waves because when the black holes collide then especially the late part of the signal matches perfectly with what they know about the curvature of space around the black hole so in that sense those are the best experiments for curvature test test of curvature and they completely are in agreement with einstein's theory also can i ask my next doubt 
Um, okay, one more question before we go to somebody else. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, if gravity is just warp, uh, warp space, so why do you need uh, gravitons? Uh, say it again. What? Is the gravity only what? Sir, if gravity is just warp space, so why do we need uh, gravitons? No, I still didn't. Gravity is the notion of a space-time curvature. That gravity means space-time is curved. If space is curved, this curvature can go in waves. These are these are gravitational waves, and gravitational waves all waves can behave like particles, all waves. So gravity wave also behave like particles, which are called gravitons. So once you have detected gravity gravitational waves, you have detected in some gravitons, but you have not really detected gravitons because graviton would be in single graviton. That you have not. It's like seeing the light coming from the sun. Doesn't mean you detect photons. For photons, you need photoelectric effect. So in that sense, we have not detected graviton. That is correct. But gravity wave would mean that there is a graviton. Okay. Yes. What's the question? Yeah. Abhishek, uh, you want to clarify the question? Okay, sir. Can I find your body's light? In any condition or in any condition? Well, sound wave uh, producing light will be very hard. Um, I mean, I um, there are two ways I suppose in which sound waves can produce, produce light. Um, sound wave, of course, carry energy, and so they can heat up the thing. So, if you have very intense, very high frequency sound wave, they absorb by some medium. That medium ho hopefully can get heated up enough to produce light. So the light will be difficult, but maybe it can get heated. In principle, it can happen. Sound waves carry incredible amount of energy when they are very intense and ultrasonic high waves. Uh, sound waves of very high frequency. So in principle, they can heat up a medium way to high uh, temperature. Sure. Or it can happen that, or uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what else. Do you, do you have any idea, Abhishek? You are asking this question, so you may have some idea. Why are you asking? Have you heard about somewhere? Master that... Ji. Sir, uh, uh, you also thought the same way you, uh, you uh, answered and explained. Sorry, what again? I also thought about the same procedure you answered now, that the intensity. Yeah, and that's the intensity. I can imagine. I, otherwise, I don't know what else would be the possibility. Yes, yes sir. I, I was only trying to just know the yes. another way. Is yeah. there any other I mean, there are other possibilities, you know, piezoelectric crystals. Piezoelectric crystals, when they, you compress them, they have voltage. So if you vibrate them, they emit electromagnetic radiation. So if you have a piezoelectric crystal and you subject it to sound wave of very high frequency, it will emit electromagnetic radiation. That is not a problem. But visible light will mean the frequency that I think sound waves cannot exist for that kind of thing. Because sound waves will not propagate, I think, in medium at that frequency, probably. Okay. Somebody was asking this question. Somebody said Master G. So, so somebody had a question with me. question kya puchna hai toh? Haan, Uriya puch sakte hain. Uriya Hindi jaise jaise puchhe. Hello. Sir, Amir Jinti, the Kichki Kharad is not a Jente EMF induced to a or electric field induced to a magnetic field change in a Sente a quality current change in a magnetic field induced to a electric field change in a magnetic field induced to a I didn't get the question. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to hear you. When did you? I cannot hear you. So, when do I cannot hear you? सर जनती हमें जान चुकी कि मैग्नेटिक फील्ड चेंज है ले वोल्टेज क्रिएट हुए सर्किट रे और इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड क्रिएट हुए जनती हमें जान चुकी करंट चेंज है ले मैग्नेटिक फील्ड क्रिएट हुए बाय करंट फील्ड मैग्नेटिक फील्ड चेंज हुए क्रिएट हुए हमारे इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड सही तो मैग्नेटिक फील्ड डायरेक्टली I 
think it's more elaborate detail, but uh, okay. Um, uh, okay, I mean, uh, yeah. when there is a current, when yeah. there is a current propagating in a wire, there is a magnetic field around that in the form of loop. Right? Uh, yes. You, you are in which class session? Um, just 11 class. Uh, so you have, seen, you have seen the expression, right? Yes. There is a current. So it's given by Ampere's law. So you can calculate the current, you can calculate the magnetic field around that. That's not your question. So that you know. So what is the question then? My question is like uh, in Faraday's law, we, we see that uh, changing magnetic field gives voltage or electric field. Right? Correct. Yes. Uh, then uh, current is related to magnetic field only or electric field only. No, both. Current can happen from both. Okay, but, I can, but we know that uh, current produces only magnetic field. There is no expression. That is correct. You are right. A current does not produce electric field. That's a good question. Current, that's a good question. I understand what you are asking. Current does not produce electric field. That is correct. Current only produces magnetic field. Current does not produce electric field because current is happening in a, electric, in a wire which is neutral, electrically neutral. So only charges are flowing. There is a positive charge background and negative charge is neutral everywhere. So it produces only magnetic field. But you see, it produces magnetic field if you are sitting with the wire. If you if you move with some velocity, so you have a wire which is moving with some velocity, you will get electric field also. Because if you uh, you know about Lorentz, you would don't okay, you don't know about Lorentz transformation. Uh, you will study that there is something called Lorentz transformation when you have a magnetic field in one reference frame and you go to you move with some velocity, you also generate electric field. So a static wire give only magnetic field, but a moving wire actually gives you electric field also along with magnetic field. Okay. And you are right that uh, a changing magnetic field gives you current and if you have a potential difference, it gives you current. But reversing also happens, but you have to move the wire with some velocity. Then you get electric field also. Is there any law which establishes that uh, electric yes, field? Is is. But what you do is first you calculate magnetic field due to a static wire, and then you calculate how it would appear if you were moving with some velocity, and there are equations given for that. This is called Lorentz transformation. Equations of special relativity. You apply that to magnetic field, and what you find is the electric field is also not zero, a magnetic field also is not zero. You'll find both of them. Okay. You will study it in, I think, 12th class probably you will not study, but BSC part one you will study. Okay. Okay. Somebody else? Sir, sir, how are black holes formed? How are black holes formed? Black holes form, uh, they, they can be, okay. First of all, black holes are uh, uh, black holes appear in different range of masses. They are black holes which have masses of several times heavier than our mass of sun, maybe one times to 10, 20 times uh, mass of sun. They are called stellar black holes. So they stars be, become black holes. Is that yes. possible? That is yes. Stars become black holes. Let me just talk about that. There are other kind of black holes also possible, but stars, stars do become black holes. Our sun would not become a black hole, but heavier stars than our sun become black holes because what happens is the stars produce this energy because of nuclear reactions. You know that, right? Yes, sir. In the core of the sun, for example, there are nuclear reactions happening. Fusion reactions are happening. So hydrogen is burning to helium. Hydrogen, deuterium are burning to helium, fusing to helium. A lighter element fuse to produce heavier element and fusion reaction produces energy. What does this reaction does is that produces a lot of energy. So it, radiation goes out. It keeps pushing star out. A star is trying to collapse because it's a huge gas cloud. Every portion is attracting every other portion by gravitational force. It's trying to collapse. But the radiation going out pushes it back. So the so star doesn't collapse. But eventually the fusion reaction uh, goes up to some level. Helium, then our in our sun, it will go up to silicon and carbon. But after that, it will not be possible. Because to fuse silicon and carbon, you need lot of density and lot of temperature. 
because silicon and and carbon at nucleus have lot of positive charge so to fuse them you need lot of density which doesn't happen so they will stop it will stop when it is a silicon carbon but some heavier stars have so much gravitational force that they keep burning until the central core becomes iron iron cannot fuse any more iron is not possible to fuse iron it doesn't give you any benefit in energy so when the uh, iron core is formed start die literally no more nuclear reaction possible gravitational force collapses this and in some cases if they start very heavy central core collapses outer core explodes in a explosion a central core core becomes a black hole okay so there is something called chandra shekhar limit right so uh, chandra shekhar limit tells you that this uh, like our sun would not become a black hole our sun will become what is called a white dwarf in white dwarf the uh, silicon carbon nucleus forms and it's trying to collapse more but it can't collapse because it has silicon carbon atoms which have nucleus and lots of electrons and you will study electrons are a specific kind of particle they are called fermions and fermions obey pauli exclusion principle pauli exclusion principle says that you cannot put two electrons very close to each other on top of each other so when they start tries to collapse electrons almost become on top of each other so there is a kind of repulsion it's called pauli repulsion so they repel each other in some sense so it started not able to collapse but this repulsion has a limit so chandrashekhar our um, great uh, indian he uh, physicist he calculated that when the core becomes larger than 1.4 times the mass of sun then this pauli exclusion principle force will not be able to stop the gravitational collapse after that a star can collapse to form either neutron star or a black hole okay that's okay. the limit okay right. somebody else so can i ask i'm not just hold on a minute let me ask somebody else if somebody else has a question somebody else sir abhishek tell me sir uh, can light be bent by the gravity ah oh, it does bend of course that was the first major test of einstein's general theory of relativity the light coming uh, say you need lot of gravitational force so they measured the light bending around sun and they found uh, the light bends exactly by same amount as uh, einstein had predicted it's just like any body will bend it uh, comet bends right comet goes around and send bends but comet is slow moving so it bends quite a lot light moves very fast so it moves very bends very little So it's very difficult to calculate the deflection, but yes, it bends and it has mass. Hmm. The light has mass. No, light doesn't have mass. Light has energy. So what happens is anything which has mass and energy, it will bend. What is space curvature, right? It's not issue of mass. Things bend because the space time is curved. In a curved curved space, there is no straight trajectory. Everything bends. As simple as that. In a curved space, there are no straight lines. is everything the bent line no so that's why the light bends okay okay somebody else sir uh, can i No, Shashank, you ask. Shashank, wait a minute. Shashank, you ask. Shashank, you can ask. Yeah. Sir, जिम्मेदारी की हमें जानने से कि प्रथम एक थियोरी है सिर्फ इलेक्ट्रिकल थियोरी इतना पर इलेक्ट्रिकल टेक्नोलॉजी। जिम्मेदारी का ना थर्मोडायनेमिक्स लॉ प्रथम या सिर्फ इतना पर स्टीम इंजन एक बुरे सब वाहन ला ना प्रथम में प्रथम का हमें जानने से कि स्टीम इंजन � बोधे थर्मोडायनेमिक्स लॉ आसले पर थी ए हम कोन कह कि ए टेक्नोलॉजी रु आसे जे ए थ्योरी गुडा ना थ्योरी रु टेक्नोलॉजी अधिक ओके पर सो क्वेश्चन that's a good question i don't know the history of this um uh, i uh, steam engine is 17th century steam engine is 17th century much before carnot's law 
way, way before that. Karnavala came much later. Yeah, Stephen Chen is way later. Yeah. Stephen Chen came much before that. Yeah. It's understanding in terms of thermodynamic sector came very, very late. So, uh, several hundred years late, actually. Like in electrical technology, whether first theory came or like. Well, I mean, it's funny, you know, in electrical technology, um, I I don't know whether the battery came first or the, the law, the, um, they think, but they were, uh, but because they had those things, that's how they did the experiment, no? They had current and all those things, but I don't know how much technology they had. They certainly had current and they had batteries and they probably had light bulbs and all those things. But so some of the basic things, see what happens in these things is some basic technology is present. With basic technology, people are able to do more experiments. Experiments give you some theoretical understanding with, you, with which you make completely new predictions, you make new theory. Those new predictions allow you to transform technology completely, which is what happened for thermodynamics. For example, steam engine gave understanding with thermodynamics and all those things later when you uh, refrigeration and those kind of technologies develop with the good understanding of Carnot's law and all those things and electricity once Maxwell equation came uh, everything just took off after that completely yeah, especially the communication telecommunication was a complete revolution with Maxwell equation so I don't know if that's what you were asking or not. What is this noise? This okay. is this crackling noise. Ah, is the crackling noise there? Achha, I don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. Ah, the question, sorry, the, what's the question again? Read again, please. Oh, it depends uh, how much kinetic energy you give it. It, uh, it can have, it can have kinetic energy for a non-relativistic system is half mv square. Electron, alpha particle and proton masses are different, m is different. But v is for you to give, velocity. So for electron to have same kinetic energy as an alpha particle, we need huge amount of velocity. The m for electron is half mv and m for proton is 1000 mv, almost 2000 times heavier for proton. So, proton mass is very large compared to electron mass. So, you will expect it has large kinetic energy, but it depends on velocity. Proton may have a small velocity, so kinetic energy may be small. So, kinetic energy is half mv square. m is the mass of the particle. v is for you to give. If you give large velocity, anything can have large kinetic energy. Okay? Mass is the constant for a particle, not the velocity. Velocity keeps changing. Okay, what else? Somebody else? Yes, Amlan had a question. Amlan, Amlan, just wait. Because let's give some time. Sometimes people are hesitant asking questions. Let's give some time. Yeah, let's wait. Somebody else has a question. Somebody who has not asked any question so far. Please ask. Whatever comes to your mind. Okay, I think we can go to Amlan, huh? <laughs> okay, Amlan, you asked it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, as you know, string theory implies us to 11 dimensions. Sir, could dark matter be graviton flicking from other dimensions into ours? I don't think there's much point in discussing this. I mean, because it's very hard to imagine 10 dimensions and those things, right? I mean, uh, this is... Um, just hold on a minute, please. Yes, sir. Ha, sorry. Um, uh, uh, you have read this statement somewhere on the internet, right? I think. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, problem is that 
if I tell you yes or no, uh, you will not know what it means, right? Because graviton leaking from higher dimension to this is a state may be loaded statement, no? So, yeah, I think uh, it's too speculative to talk about that. The point is that the, what is happens in what happens for the particles in higher dimension and how they manifest in lower dimension is uh, I, actually, for example, I don't know whether you are referring to what they call a theory of uh, in which uh, there are brains, there are brains in which gravitons exist between the brains and our electrons, etc., are on one membrane, membrane less let's say. And then, then it gravitons exist in between and can they come to our things? That could be a possibility. Or the fact that other dimensions are curled up and how those gravitons which are going in higher dimension manifest in lower dimension. Any of those could be the meaning. Okay. So this is, for a point is this, I'm learned that uh, it, uh, the kind of physics which is needed to understand this thing um, is uh, the statement is very unfamiliar to um, at your level. So we'll have difficult time discussing this, no? <laughs> yes, sir. So whatever yeah. I read on yeah. the internet, sir, it was very contradictory. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you wait for it. you wait to understand. You wait to read a little more in higher classes, then you worry about this. Okay. My next doubt is, sir, what exactly is the problem preventing us from having a grand unified field theory? Okay. Now, what is the grand unified field theory? You do, sir. Uh, so that's the mixture of all fundamental uh, forces. Not mixture of fundamental forces. Not the mixture. Yeah. Uh, just like a combination? No. It, it means that uh, they become unified. It means they the single force above that. And the nature of the force becomes different at lower energy. But like electricity and magnetism. I'll give you an example. Of when you people talk about Gan unified theory, um, example is uh, when people discovered electricity earlier, they knew that the current flows, say the current flow, and uh, Electricity appears when you rub the comb, comb the hair by uh, comb or rub the things, then they start attracting paper particles. No? That's electricity. And magnetic field, they knew because they had magnets. So they didn't, they really thought the electricity is different, magnetic is different. Electrical forces are different, magnetic forces are different. Eventually, they had all the Faraday's law, Ampere's law, and they realized it's the electric current. Flow of electric charges which gives you current, which gives you magnetic field, and Maxwell equation unifies it. So that's why they don't you don't call it electricity, and you call it electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is a single force. It manifests sometimes electric field, sometimes magnetic field. So similarly, we have electromagnetic force and we have weak force, which is responsible for uh, beta decay, and nuclear radioactivity. Yes, sir. We appear to completely different forces, but now we know. These are manifestations of same force. It's called electroweak force. It manifests in different ways. Depends where it's acting. Different in where you see it, it appears in different, but it's a single force, electro electroweak force. So then people are trying to see that the, the nuclear force and electroweak force, they also appear very different. Are they manifestations of a single force? If they are manifestations of single force, that would be called Gan unified theory. So it's not a mixture of these things, but it's like it's trying to see a single force whose manifestations are different in different situations. That's what it means, uh, Gan unification. Okay? So so but why it's still a hypothesis? We don't have a theory of that so far. Okay, wait, Amla, now there was, a, there was a question on chat box. Uh, please ask, you know, in the chat box, you can ask a question. What question is your question? I'm not able to read chat box. I don't know why not. Okay, here it is. Uh, I can see. In sky wave mode of propagation, why the frequency rate of transmitting signal restricted to less than 30 megahertz? Okay, um, uh, the see sky is uh, uh, the upper portion of the sky is ionosphere. I actually um, less than 30 megahertz. Uh, I don't know precisely the number 30 megahertz, but the reason would be probably is this that the upper Sky wave mode of propagation by uh, uh, does it, when you mean sky wave, do you mean transmitting through the atmosphere or bouncing from the atmosphere? This I'm not sure. That sky mode could mean two things. One thing is communicating to satellite. 
so you have to go through the go through the sky go through the uh, atmosphere another is uh, bouncing from the atmosphere like suppose i want to listen to radio america america is on the other side of earth how do i get signal from that it doesn't come through earth it comes because it bounces from the atmosphere multiply it comes to you atmosphere it bounces from the atmosphere upper layer upper layer atmosphere is, is ionized it has ion in it so it, it's not neutral gas electron gets separated so it's like a plasma uh, in that plasma it's a conduct it's a kind of conducting medium so the electromagnetic waves when they when they come certain frequencies will bound some other frequency will not bound they will go through it so if you want the uh, that's why the uh, long wavelength you know they 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 the afm radio and they they the fm radio frequency modulation amplitude modulation af a, a, am sorry amplitude modulation and frequency modulation am is amplitude modulation fm is frequency modulation frequency modulation radios use very high frequency gigahertz and amplitude modulation use less uh, frequency so amplitude modulation when you listen to radio america unless it comes from satellite if you are it coming standard radio then the signal goes and bounces from atmosphere upper atmosphere it can only happen for uh, low frequency large wavelength if it is larger frequency like fm it will go through it maybe that's what you are referring to sky wave mode of propagation sarojini ji is this question clear to you sarojini answer minimum three satellites need for communication no satellite you only need one satellite for communication but if you need three satellites are needed for what called triangulation uh, you need uh, we, we need in our google map google map tells you where you are how would it know where you are what happens is satellites are sending signal at precise timing so suppose all satellites send a signal exactly at a given time now if there are if there is three satellites at different positions then their signals will reach you at different time okay if they reach exactly same time they are exactly at same distance away from you so either way they by the arrival time of signal they know where you are on earth arrival time difference two if you have only two satellites it will not be able to give you position it will give you a circle actually it will not give you a, a precise position you need three satellites actually to to what called triangulation to correctly give your position that's why three satellites is needed or maybe okay i don't know maybe you need three satellites need for uh, communication across the earth maybe that's what you, actually why somebody should be, you should ask the question directly that may be because the satellite if that's what you are asking then the reason being this ki if you are uh, communicating across the earth satellites are not very high up of, on that mass here so you need if you are going on opposite side of earth you know you need to transmit signal to this satellite to this satellite and then to you single satellite will not work just try to draw a line single satellite will not work they are not they are not very far away from earth so if you try to draw earth and try signal and satellite little above that and try to draw a straight line you will see that one satellite will not work two will be hard and three are good i think maybe that's what you are asking i don't know okay any other question can i i'm not just wait let's see if somebody else has a question somebody else has any question so have you read a, a brief history of time i did little bit i didn't complete it So you have read it? So I have like theory of everything. I'm just uh, listening a podcast. Okay. I, uh, uh, if you read it, you can tell me interesting portions from that. I'll be happy to hear. But so Big Bang Theory, like uh, Stephen Hawking explains about the Big Bang Theory to black uh, holes. Yeah, very good. So listen to that. This very nice. Stephen Hawking was a great scientist. so his books are very good i have heard so you read books and uh, if you you read that and if you have questions from that you can ask me okay okay sir okay. anybody else have a question 
why is reaction between methane and chlorine in the presence of sunlight considered sub? Okay, I don't know. I my chemistry is very poor, so please don't don't ask me chemistry question. Sorry. In the presence of sunlight, consider substitution reaction. It really is a chemistry question, and I, I knew little chemistry that also I forgotten. <laughs> after twelfth, I never studied chemistry. It's after tenth, I think I did study. No, after twelfth. Both of them, maybe, yeah, yeah. We should probably have a. Uh, Scott chemistry open discussion session by somebody who knows chemistry, you know, and mod mathematics open discussion. Maybe. Sir, 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 you have a question, huh? Tell me, sir. Ah, uh, Jim, see, I'm a phone. दूर दस तो मुटा शुणी कि जो मैंने आस्ट्रोनट मैंने दूरता विषय कहते से दूरता गुड़ा इनस्टाटली मापन से गुड़ा बहुत वर्ष दूरता था तो यहाँ के दूर सब ताले अपन मन जो इमेज गुड़ा पाउच चंदी से उड़ा एक्चुअली ये बे इंस्टेंट रो ना पुरुना इमेज है पिक्चर गुड़ा सोची सर एक्चुअली से गुड़ा इधर है ना सर अब जो तारा रो जो लाइट गुड़ा सोची जैसे गुड़ा तो इतने ब्राइट लाइट नहीं होता कोई इंटेंस करिए कौन से दिखा रहा है I mean, uh, we have very big telescope, very very powerful telescope. So um, you are able to see far from distant galaxies actually now. In fact, so much so that they are able to even detect. I think they have even detected a a, a, a planet in an extra galactic star. That much so. I mean, so they they, they have huge telescopes, and now we have a space telescope. You know, Hubble telescope was great, and they now they have James Webb telescope. So they have uh, the stars are very far away, so the light comes from. But they have also very good telescope and a fantastic detection technique. So they are able to detect this. Okay. So can I? Okay, I'm done. No. Sir, does the energy of an object depends upon its uh, weight, size, or uh, both? The energy, you mean the kinetic energy or what energy? Total energy, mc square. Yes, sir. It's just mc square. That's it. Mass times c square. But mass is a relativistic mass. 
it, whether his body is moving or not, it depends on that. M not uh, mass of the body is M not divided by root one minus p square by c square. So with moving, it has a relativistic mass times c square. That is the energy of the object. So whatever else is contained uh, is called contained in M. My second doubt is, so when you watch a, so, uh, so when you watch a movie, sir, how do sound and light arrive at the same time, even though light travels faster than sound? Well, uh, you know the speed of sound? Uh, yes, sir. How much it is? How much it is? Sir? How much it is? You know? So it is written in books. It's about 330 meters per second. Hmm. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, That's is it in vacuum or? Uh, in vacuum, but air is almost like that. No, uh, vacuum, sound waves don't travel, right? Air. I'm talking about air. Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, sir. If you are in a metal or something, it's speed less, much larger, but it's the sound is 330 meters per second. And uh, in the screen, how far is the screen typically from you when you see in cinema hall? About 30, 40 meters, no? 20, 30 meters. Right? Yes, sir. So that means the sound comes in one tenth of a second. You, you cannot notice the difference. You cannot notice the difference. So what somebody is speaking something, right? So the picture comes to you almost instantly. So somebody spoke something or some explosion happened on the screen or some, okay. The explosion happened, the light came immediately, the sound came one tenth of a second later. You cannot make out difference one tenth of a second right? from the scene. So it appears to come exactly, but, but you, you know the difference when lightning happens, right? Lightning happens in standard example. You see, you hear, you see the lightning and the sound comes much later, right? Thunder. So, so that is a uh, great, perfect example by how sound travels slowly. It, it's a very big time difference. Time is different is few seconds, four, five seconds sometimes, five, six seconds. Light, light, suddenly you see the lightning uh, shine and then sound comes after few seconds, five, six seconds. You can actually calculate that way how far lightning, ha lightning happened. Because sound, light velocity is so fast, you can imagine the light came instantly, immediately. So when you see the lightning, you know the lightning happened exactly at the same time. Calculate after how many seconds the light came, you can exactly calculate how far the lightning happened. Where is that cloud where lightning is happening? Right? So my third doubt is, uh, so how does the lambda CDM model also state that time itself started? Okay. What is lambda CDA model for you? Do you know what is lambda and C? What are those things in this case? Can you elaborate? No, no. What are those things? When you say lambda CDA model, what do you know what the lambda CDM is? So just I, after I the, huh? What is lambda? Uh, so just after the Big Bang theory, so some scientists given this model. So how universe started? What is the full question? What, in lambda CDM model, what what is the question? So how does the lambda CDM model also state that time itself started? What I am asking is, uh, okay, let me just say simply, lambda CDM model you ignore because you have not studied about that. But how time started, we can address that question. The time started when the universe Big Bang happened. There was nothing before the Big Bang. So Big Bang is the time, I mean, I shouldn't say nothing happened before Big Bang because we don't know what happened before that. But we only calculate things when Big Bang happened. So whatever happened before that, we have no idea. We calculate time from that. So I, it's not correct to say time started from that point, but we calculate from that. You know, you always can set t equal to zero somewhere, right? So, so we call Big Bang at t equal to zero. It's not the time started. We said t equal to zero. Before that, we have no idea what was the space, what was time. We can't calculate those things. But we know how time changed after that. Before that, how time changed, we have no idea. So we don't, we just calculate after that. Okay. So let's say the theory of Big Bang theory. Let's not call lambda CDM model. Let's say Big Bang theory. Big Bang theory says that universe started 13.7 billion years ago. From that, we can calculate onward how time and space change. Before that, we have no idea. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So what is the difference between convex on and uh, brown on? What is the difference between convex? 
convection and brownian motion is, a, is convection a, and brownian motion okay convection is something in which the convection happens in fluids right so if you have a fluid you heat up from the bottom then it gets heated so it expands its density becomes low so it rises up it rises up so it displaces the liquid on top which goes down so this kind of motion which happens because of temperature differences and force of gravity is called convection motion bulk motion the fluid the whole fluid is rising up brownian motion is the motion of tiny particles inside a medium like air or water when there are very tiny particles not the not the atom itself not the molecule of at water but suppose there is some impurity or some tiny microscopic particles or bacteria when they are there they they get bombarded by atom molecules from all sides but they they are not able to too many of them are hitting but they don't balance forces so these these bodies move in random direction that's called brownian motion so brownian motion is motion of microscopic particles randomly because of motion of atoms in molecules and convection is because of heat balance temperature difference when the whole fluid moves uh, gas molecules bulk motion gas molecules also exhibit random motion is there different from that? right so in gas also so in gas they can be brownian motion if they they for example uh, the the smoke particles smoke particles are little carbon clusters and the they are moving in a gas so the hot air molecules they hit each other so smoke particles carry out brownian motion in gas sir i am talking about is the exact the, the molecules of the gas exhibit brownian motion or the smoke particles that's not called brownian motion no brownian motion term is reserved see uh, Uh, generally, Brownian motion term is they call they move randomly. Certainly, all molecules move randomly. So uh, it's generally more call a molecules of gases. You call them random box. They call random box. Brownian motion term is typically referred to motion of uh, little heavier particles which are surround which are hit by uh, molecules around. So they move in a random direction. Brownian motion typically term is referred to for two, but they are yeah. like gas molecules actually. Random. They are related to impurity or the impurity. It can be impurity or some embedded particle, okay. which is bigger than atoms and molecules. Okay. Okay. Somebody else. Sir, sir, recently NASA just uh, invented the James Webb Telescope, and uh, just it captures infrared waves. So I can cannot understand that in what way it can time travel into the past. Who said that James Webb travel can tell travel? No, sir. It can just detect things in the past that oh, that yeah, had yeah. happened. That is, see, Dr. Patnaik had just explained right now when somebody asked the question. that when you take picture of a star and that star is say 1000 light years away so dr patnaik was explaining this to somebody you know that you take a picture of a star which is 1000 light years away 1000 light years away means that light takes 1000 years to travel from that star to you yes, so if you take a picture today you are getting picture of a star which left that star 1000 years ago so you only know when you take picture to do you know how star was 1000 years ago you don't have no idea how the star looks right now you don't even know that the star exists today so you have seen the star in past so james webb is a very big telescope which will be able to see pictures of objects which are billions of light years away so you take picture and what you will find is that light left that object billion years ago billion years ago earth was not even there So in yes, that sense, you are able to see things in very much past, but it's not that you are able to travel. It's taking the picture of something past. That's so, all. can we time travel into the future? Uh, no, we cannot have time travel in future or in past. There is no technology available, but people keep discussing that, and there are a lot of good movies on that. You can watch some science fiction. Yes, movies. sir. I have a lot of fun. So we can time travel, but uh, only if we travel with the speed of light. Uh, uh, no, for time traveling, you need to travel with speed the faster than the speed of light, which is not possible. Yes. Even uh, with the speed of light, you can't time travel. It's faster than the speed of light. Okay, somebody else was trying to ask question right now. Uh, somebody else was. So there would be time dilation. 
time dilation is there anyway, but time dilation uh, in a reverse direction will happen if you move with faster density doubling. Sabita, you have a question? Somebody had a question. Anybody else? Sir, can't we use robots and Amlan, just hold on. I think somebody else was trying to ask a question. I'll give you last question, Amlan, anyway, but let me see if somebody else was trying to ask a question who had not asked. Anybody wants to ask a question? I'll take two more questions. One from Amlan, one somebody else. Yeah. Anybody else? Rinwala, please stop your presentation. Okay. Sir. Abhishek, tell me. The sound that we hear uh, while lightning, sir, how it is produced? And in some cases, uh, lightning is um, lightning happens with some uh, sound, and uh, we cannot hear sound. Right. The uh, the sound basically is lightning. Actually, uh, the sound the way it happens is the lightning. Uh, see what happens? Lightning did a discharge. So there's a discharge because there is huge potential difference. So because of huge potential difference, the electrical resistance breaks down. The gas becomes ionized, and the air becomes ionized. And in the ionized thing, the current flows. So what happens generally when the sound happens is that the current flows. It produces tremendous amount of heat, and so much heat that the air in that column expands explosively. That's a blast. That's the thunder which you hear. That's the chat chat which you hear. So that is the extremely heated air explosively expanding. That's the thunder which you hear. So it happens sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. Happen. Doesn't happen. And sir, in every lightning there is a pattern like a branch. Not any other. Uh, only always we see the uh, the pattern is like uh, the lightning goes in the pattern of a branch. Right. Not a straight. Because it keeps because it depends on how the ionization will happen. So actually, lightning is a very complex phenomenon. What happens is the the bolt basically what happens in this case is that the voltage potential difference from top to bottom. So and the ionization of gas which happens depends on lot of properties: voltage difference, moisture, and all those things, and how much are the impurities like uh, salt and all those things, other impurities. So when ionization happens. The gas gets ionized in different branches, different ways, and all those ionized channels, the current can flow, and current flows in those channels. So it's a very random uh, kind of branching phenomena. But it's detailed process. Uh, people know the detailed process. I know roughly the overall picture. It's a very, very interesting, very complicated phenomena. By the way, uh, have you you have you read the uh, Feynman's lecture, uh, physics like, and physics? Are you aware of this? There are Feynman's lectures in physics, several volume. Uh, if you can get it somewhere online, I think there are cheap edition. Indian edition is available. It is the best source of undergraduate physics. There is no better book ever written than Feynman lecture. I think it is volume two of that, which discusses electricity and magnetism. The volume two or volume three, I don't remember. It has a great discussion of lightning phenomena. Bad, fantastic discussion. It's the best discussion I have ever seen anywhere. So if you can get hold of Feynman lecture volume two or three, I don't remember. Uh, look for electricity magnetism and read the section on lightning. It's a very beautiful discussion. It will explain you all these details which you are asking. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. One more last question. I'll take. Uh, I'll, uh, Amlan is here. Are you? You ask your question. Then we'll close. Yes. You want to ask? Yes, sir. Sir, can sir can't you use? Uh... Uh, black hole and uh, wormhole and uh, so white hole for the time travel. So black hole, wormhole and uh, white no, hole. So neither, just opposite of black hole. We have access to black hole, not wormhole, and white hole is only a theoretical construct. Wormhole in principle can exist, and black holes do exist. But uh, there is no theory which can be worked out which allows for time travel using black hole or uh, black hole. Wormhole people do talk about possibility of time travel. But uh, that's it. Not white hole. No. Okay. I think with this question we will uh, close the session today. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, bye. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay. Bye, bye, everybody. Yes. Next, next month we'll see everybody next month. Okay. Bye.
ओके सुबिनी जी थैंक यू वेरी मच सुबिनी जी आपका म्यूट हो गया फिर ओके राइट विल मीट ओके ऑल राइट बाय